here and a blue vertex there. Uh, when I, I pick a random dimer cover and then the red, red guy will jump to, the, to his neighbor and the blue guy will jump to his neighbor and then I get this new configuration here. Of course, you know, you can keep track of just a, some small number of vertices or you can keep track of all 12 vertices. In this case, uh, if you keep track of all 12 vertices, then it's a random walk on S12, this, the permutation group on 12 elements. And that's the, that's the problem to study that random walk. I, why is that an interesting question? Uh, well, before I, before, I, before I answer that, let me just give you the example. Here's an example of a very small graph. Uh, it's got six vertices, but uh, uh, if I just remember the X coordinates of the vertices, then uh, the random walk you know, projects to that S, rather than, rather than have a random walk on S6, which is kind of a big group, uh, if I just consider the, the projection, I get this essentially the same random walk and it just looks like uh, it's a random walk on S3 now, which uh, you can see that with probably one third, uh, your X coordinate does not change, right? Th this graph has three dimer covers. One of them uses all three vertical edges. And then the other two are, you know, like this or like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so with probably one third, the permutation does not change. Your X coordinate does not change. Uh, and if you're on the left with probably uh, two thirds, then you jump to the right. Uh, that is, well, and yeah, <laughs> with probably one, with probably one third, you stay, you, you, it's the identity permutation on the X coordinates with probably one third is it's uh, the first two coordinate switch with probably one third, the second two coordinate switch. So that's a, you know, very simple random walk on the, this is the Cayley graph of the symmetric group, uh, which is e kind of easy to analyze in this case. The problem is to analyze it uh, for a more general graph. And uh, for example, if my graph is uh, regular, like this, it's sort of an n by n grid on a torus, then each each particle is just doing a simple random walk because the probability that it gets matched to any one of its four neighbors is the same, one fourth if it's a n by n torus, just by symmetry. So each particle is just doing a simple random walk, but those all the particles are sort of coupled in such a way to avoid each other, and. Uh, it's interesting to, I think it would be an interesting problem to, you know, analyze the trajectories. How quickly does it mix? What's the, how do they braid with each other? These kind of problems uh, are all very interesting from a from probabilistic or stat mech point of view. Any questions? One, one vertex is doing exactly a uniform random walk. Because it's just jumping with probably one quarter to each of his neighbors, uh, at least on this graph. I don't understand the question. Is that a question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The next the the, the next questions are unrelated to that first one. Uh, but um, one natural generalization of the dimer model where is, is to put weights on the edges. And so in, our, in that graph up there, uh, we have, a, uh, you know, we've got seven edges. I could just put seven different weights, which are just positive real numbers, which I assign to the edges. Then each dimer cover has a weight, which is the product of the edge, of the edge weight. So the, so the all vertical dimer cover here will have weight, you know, G times B times D. So each dimer cover gets its own weight and then you can make a probability measure from those weights where the probability of a particular cover is proportional to the weights. <clears throat> so if, you know, if G is large, then that edge is more likely to appear in your random dimer cover. So this is a kind of a common thing we do in StatMac is to, is to put, uh, you know, different, diff put as many parameters in the model as we can and hope that we can use those parameters to say something interesting about the typical behavior. But <clears throat> I want to, uh, you know, I want to talk about a new point of view on, on these weights, which uh, is not obvious. Uh, uh, and, you know, it, it's, but it adds some geometry to the problem. So rather than think about these positive real numbers associated to the edges as just 
edge weights or if uh, in in the dimer which which changed the dimer measure i want to think of them as a as determining a connection on a line bundle and uh what do i mean by that well uh let me tell you what a vector bundle on a graph is it's a very simple object you just put a uh you have a fixed vector space v here everybody can see my cursor yeah you have a fixed vector space v and you put a copy of v at each vector at each vertex in the graph sitting over each vertex in the graph that's a vector bundle on a graph a very simple sort of combinatorial object and what's a connection then on every edge of the graph you have to somehow connect those two vector spaces so you put some isomorphism along that edge uh, and of course if you go if you go back so for each ed, or, oriented edge directed edge from u to v you have an isomorphism from, from the corresponding vector spaces and if you go backwards you use the inverse isomorphism that's that's called a connection on your vector bundle and the line bundle is just means a, a vector bundle where each vector space is just one dimensional all right so uh when you have a line bundle that is you just have a one-dimensional vector space at each vertex what's an isomorphism between two one-dimensional vector spaces is just a real number a multiplication by a real scalar and that's that's the identification we make with the edge weight so if, if your graph happens to be bipartite uh, then you can orient the edges like here you can orient the edges from the white vertex to the black vertex and then having a a positive real edge weight just means that you have an isomorphism you have a distinguished isomorphism from the one dimensional vector space here to to one there what you know what's the point of this uh, it's just in some sense it's just a different point of view on what this data is of a, a bunch of edge weights but uh, the reason it's helpful is that it highlights a certain symmetry that was that's not evident in the original model and that symmetry is the gauge symmetry when I've got a line bundle with a connection, I can change the, the basis at any one of the vector spaces. Uh, and, you know, you know that uh, changing basis in a vector space is not changing. And it gives you an isomorphic uh, bundle, of course. Uh, but that corresponds to multiplying the edge weights, as, as indicated here, incident to any, any uh, vertex by a constant. So this operation uh, of gauge transfer, this gauge transformation, gauge symmetry, is a large symmetry group, which uh, in fact uh, does not change the probability measure, right? If you go, if I go back to the definition of the probability measure, if I change these, if I change these weights, for example, if I multiply the A and the G here by some constant, the, the each dimer cover will have a, if, if I multiply them both by some constant, you know, X, then each dimer cover will get multiplied by X because each dimer cover will use exactly one of these two edges. And so the, the, the probability measure then will not change because the weight will multiply by X, but the denominator will also multiply by the same quantity X. So the measure uh, is, 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 a, is, since it's a homogeneous function of these H, of these, of these weights, it uh, doesn't change when you apply the gauge transformation. So there's this large group of symmetries, uh, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily see if you just think about it in terms of straight, straight in terms of edge weights. Well, uh, shortly, we're going to generalize this setting to higher rank bundles, like, uh, in particular SLN, when uh, instead of having a line bundle here, I'm going to have an end, a, a dimension n vector space, Rn, associated to each vertex. And then the, the, uh, the isomorphisms, of course, can, are gonna, now going to be in, in, well, generally in GLN, but uh, I'm going to specialize to SLN. And we'll get something nice from there. Um, so that's that's another reason why uh, this change of point of view from weights to connections is, you know, in interesting. It, it gives you an interest, uh, interesting way to generalize it to this higher rank case. And it also connects the problems to geometry. In in there, there are many sort of instances where the, you know, thinking thinking where the rather than thinking sort of combinatorially as the edge weights is just some sort of weight which you associate to an edge. If you think about it as a connection, that leads to some, some interesting geometry. And, and when people deal with uh, uh, stru SLN structures on surfaces and tichomolar space and higher tichomolar space, this is the relevant geometry for, in that setting. 
Okay, so, uh, but let me get, let me get to problem two, um, which is a very, also very easy to state. But first of all, um, for this particular graph, you know, I put an edge weight on all seven edges and that's kind of a lot of data. But what we see from the gauge equivalence is that, uh, you know, I can choose a, I can, choose a gauge equivalence to make all the edge weights equal to one on some spanning tree of the graph uh, because the spanning tree is you know, contractible. And then the, the, essentially all I've got is one weight, one variable left over for each edge, which is not in the spanning tree. That is each, the, the, the actual space of uh, uh, independent weights is just the dimension of the cycle space of the graph. In this case, it's just two dimensional. So really there's, if I look at all the edge weights here, and I mod out by the natural gauge group acting, then the uh, resulting space is just, well, if it's a planar graph, it's just the number of, number of bounded faces of the graph, in this case two. More generally, it would be the dimension of the cycle space of the graph. So let me just call those uh, new, new variables X, uh, X variables, so one, one for each face. Like I said, all my, almost all my graphs are planar in this talk. So for each fa face of the graph, I'm gonna have a, a single positive real number called the face weight. And, and how is it related to the original weights here? It's the alternating product. So this here, if I look at, if I go around the cycle, counterclockwise, starting from a white vertex, I see the edge weights A, B, F, G, and the corresponding face weight here is just the alternating product, A divided by B times F divided by G. And likewise for X2. Okay, so I've, I've reduced myself from this seemingly seven dimensional space of weights to really the only fundamentally, it's, it's only fundamentally a two dimensional problem. That, that I mean, two dimensional set of measures here, the probability measures. And the problem now, problem two, open problem two is, well, it's not really, stated as an open problem, but it's, a, it's really a research problem. Study the map from the face weights. In this case, the, uh, the suppose we have a planar graph is the face weights. In, more generally, it's gonna be a cycle basis to the edge probabilities uh, in the, for the random dimer model, which uh, uh, is related to those weights. So in this case, you know, associated to this, set of seven weights or the set of two face weights is a two dimensional space of probability measures, one for each. Uh, so there's a map, right? What I mean is that there's a map from the face weights to the probability measures. And that's, and well, how do we, what's the dimension of this space of, of probability, of edge probabilities? It turns out that that's also, the dimension of that is the same. It's the dimension of the cycle space. So that's what I need to describe next. Uh, what is the space of edge probabilities of a dimer model on a bipartite graph? Well, uh, I feel like going, going to the next slide and coming back to this one. Here's, if it, just, if you look at the upper left, upper right corner there, if I know that the, the edge probabilities of the edge of the leftmost edge P and the rightmost edge Q, then the other edge probabilities are all determined, right? Because the, the fact is that this vertex has to be either in the vertical edge or the horizontal edge. And therefore the probabilities, these two probabilities have to add up to one. So if I know P, I know this has to be one minus P. And if I know Q, this has to be one minus Q and one minus Q and, therefore, and then I know the center one. So in fact, the, the space of edge probabilities is the same dimension as the space of face weights. So we, so we, so that makes it interesting to ask, you know, I have, this, I have this map from weights to probabilities and they're two, between two spaces of the same dimension. What is that map? Uh, so more general, so let me sort of explain that in a general setting, there's this uh, certain uh, polytope, uh, which I'm calling omega here, capital omega, it's called the polytope of fractional matchings. What is, what is it, fractional, fractional matchings or fractional dimer covers? These are just functions on the edges, which take values in zero one, and which sum to one at each vertex. Uh, right, so in some, uh, right, it's like, uh, 
positive functions, non-negative functions on the edges, which sum to one of each vertex, right? If you, whenever I have a dimer cover, right, that, a dimer cover defines a, a function on the edges by, 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 by giving value one to every dimer and zero to all the other edges. This has the prob 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 property that uh, that function sums to one of each vertex. Uh, but if I, a, a fractional dimer cover is, a, is some other function, which, well, I I'm not gonna get it right here, <laughs> but uh, you can imagine having uh, fractional weights which still satisfy the property that they sum to one of each vertex, those functions uh, define a certain polytope uh, capital omega. And it's a theorem, a standard theorem of, I'm not even sure who is due to it. It's a folklore, I guess, that this is a polytope and the vertices of that polytope are the actual dimer covers of the graph. I don't know what that means. Yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, right, so... Uh, we have this, there's a certain polytope which you associate to any graph and in particular, any bipartite graph uh, whose vertices are exactly the dimer covers. But of course it's a, and the points, the interior points of that polytope are these fractional dimer covers. And the, if you look at uh, one side, if I choose, if I have a measure, if I have a probability measure on the space of dimer covers, I got a probability, that means I have a probability measure on the vertices of this polytope. It has a center of mass which is somewhere inside that polytope. And that center of mass is the, th th those are the edge, those are the edge, that's the vector of edge probabilities, right? Uh, that center of mass defines a point, a, a function on the edges, uh, and, that's, and those are the probabilities. And so, you know, okay, so that's the question. Here's the question I, I you know, if I let the uh, face weights vary, the base, base weights can be arbitrary positive real numbers. Then I get a arbitrary set point in that polytope, P and Q in this case. And in fact, I just worked it out explicitly for this particular graph, it's easy enough. Uh, it's an explicit sort of rational map here, X1, X2 goes to, you know, whatever this is, one plus X2 over one plus, you know, it's got the same denominator, but the numerator is a little bit different. Uh, and, you know, this was originally gonna be one of my open questions, right? Uh, is this a, diffeomorphism, but it's actually not that hard to prove in the process of, you know, writing up my talk. Uh, <laughs> I realized that this was, this is one of those open questions, which is not open, uh, uh, but if, or under some reason, reasonably reasonable condition on the graph G, this is actually a diffeomorphism. It's kind of an interesting non-trivial diffeomorphism from uh, some big orthant uh, onto some, you know, actual polytope. Uh, what does non-degenerate mean? It just means that every edge participates, every edge participates in some dimer cover. And I mean, every edge is, is uh, uh, has probably somewhere strictly between zero and one. So that means there are some dimer covers which it doesn't use, don't use that edge and some which do use, use that edge. Yes? Yes, yes. Does it extend to the boundary? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't think it always extends to the faces. It extends to the vertices. I mean, but you have to take limits. Uh, it's it's only about the interior. Okay, so I I, I missed something here, right? B is a diffeomorphism onto the interior, right? Because after all, the positive weights are it's an open set, so it can't go to a Yes. Yeah, it looks like this, this, uh, this, right. The dimension of the polytope is the number of edges. It's the dimension of the cycle space, which is the number of edges in the complement of a spanning tree. Yeah. Which is the same as the dimension of the, well, right. Both sides are the same dimension. Yeah. Are there more questions? Yes, Sergey. No. It's subtraction free forward. 
Yeah, in fact, I had a, you didn't see the inverse yet, but there's, there's the inverse for that example. Hang on, I just, I can't see everything on my screen. So I, I occasionally have to refer to it. <laughs> I can see it up here. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, these are great questions. Yeah, <laughs> right. I I didn't want to think too much about this thing because uh, I still wanted to present it as an open problem. So, all. <laughs> great, great, great. Thank you. So, right. So the question for those of you who are not in the audience, by the way, the question was: uh, Does this? Can you make this extend to the boundary in some way? And those are, I don't have a, I don't have a pat, I don't have an immediate answer to that. So those are, that's a good question to study. That's what I meant by study. Uh, and uh, here's a related question. Uh, it, it's a diffeomorphism, which means it's Jacobian is, uh, you know, non-zero. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> it's not an implication, but this Jacobian is not, happens to be non-zero. Uh, that's how the proof goes. Uh, but uh, in the examples I, in the small examples I constructed, the Jacobian determinant does look like it's subtraction free. So I don't know if that's true in general. More interestingly, uh, you can ask the, the degree, it's not always, unlike the, the example that I presented here, this, this example has a, is invertible uh, and there's an explicit inverse, but the example here, you find that this map if you extend the map to all of R n, not just the positive orthant, you find that it's degree two. That is, for any probabilities, set of probabilities, there are actually two preimages in general. Only one of them is positive; the other one has negative weights. Uh, and I'm, I, but, but in all the examples I did, all the other preimages were also real. So it, I think there may be some sort of reality, interesting reality condition on this map, Frank. It's not a linear projection. Well, Nothing is linear here. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's probably something going on here. Thanks. Any more questions? If P and Q are strictly between zero and one, then this, uh, these are both, these are both positive. P, Q and P plus Q all have to be, so let me go back, sorry. Remember, so this, this, this middle edge, P and Q uh, uh, aren't taking any, they, they can, it's not all possible sets of probabilities, right? There's some inequalities they have to satisfy, right? For example, P plus Q has to be bigger than one because of the central edge. No, no, the X1 and X2 lie in an orthant, P and Q lie in the, that polytope, which in this case is some triangle, right? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it sounds like we have something to talk about. Okay, going on. Uh, that's enough for the dimer model. Let's talk about the double dimer model. What's the double dimer model? Well, here's a sort of large random dimer cover of some big grid, and I can bring in another independent dimer cover and just draw them on top of each other. And then I get this collection of loops and doubled edges. Uh, uh, and uh, I drew it in color, but I want you to forget the color and just pretend like everything is, you know, aquamarine or something. And what's anyway? 
black. And so you get a set of double dimer. That's called a double dimer cover when you forget the colors. That is, you just get a second uh, collection of loops and doubled edges. Uh, and of course, uh, each double dimer cover, I mean, <laughs> the set of double dimer covers, if you count them with, by weighting each loop with a factor of two, then that's the same thing as the square of the single dimer, the, the number of single dimer covers. That's the, I shouldn't even put that little fact in. It's just to make sure that we understand the definition of the double dimer cover is not just a pair of single dimer covers. It's a pair of single dimer covers where you forget the colorings so that this, so you forget this factor of two. Loop me cycle, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, was there still a question? Yeah, parallel edges don't count as a loop. No, but they don't, you don't get a factor of two for parallel edges. Uh, okay, but the question is, uh, you know, here's, if I take a large graph like this, maybe Z2, uh, can I say something non-trivial about the distribution of the loops? Like what's their typical size? What's their typical length? Uh, what's the probability of having a loop of length a thousand? Uh, right? Uh, is there some sort of interesting scaling limit of this soup of loops? Uh, and you can, uh, uh, that's what is called, in fact, a loop soup. Uh, people who do, you know, SLE type stuff uh, conjecture that, the, that this uh, limiting process, when you let, if you let the scaling of the lattice go to zero, you take Z2, take the double dimer model, take the scaling to, to zero, you get a you get one of these conformally and very fractal process called CLE4, related to the SLE4 process. Anyway, uh, various tools have been developed over the years, uh, some from myself, to compute probabilities of dimers. And you can compute the probability of having a, a little square. It, it, you know, if I, if, I, if I point my finger at a given uh, face of this graph and ask what's the probability that all four edges around it are present, that probably happens to be exactly one over 32 in the limit as n gets large. It's something you can compute. And the probability that your loop has, uh, you know, area two here uh, is, you know, some more complicated number, pi minus one squared over four, or two times four pi to the fourth. But you know, as the as the loop gets more complicated, uh, these expressions, even though they're in principle computable, uh, get more complicated, and we don't really have any good uh, technique uh, for saying things uh, in general. Here's one method you can use to. I want to going back to the bundle theory. I want to explain one method you can use to compute the well, the number of loops which surround a given face. Right. If I if I take a uh, planar graph, I, I have my favorite face, let's say the one in the center, and I want to know in my double dimer uh, cover what's how many loops uh, will surround that that face with a star in it. And uh, what I can do in that in that set, setting is to use a uh, line bundle, uh, which has a uh, I, I'm going to put some edge weights. Well, let's see how to explain. I'm going to put the connection so that uh, it's going to be a flat connection, so that all the, the any loop which which doesn't surround that face will have will have a trivial uh, monitor on me. <laughs> if you if you compose the if you compose the connection around the loop, you'll get you'll get the trivial uh, isomorphism. Monodromy one, but if you go around the star, you'll get monodromy q. If you if your loop happens to surround that face with a star in it, you get monodromy q. And uh, when so it turns out that you can compute the using the standard Castellane theory, which I haven't actually even talked about yet. Uh, you can compute the partition function for the this collection of loops with this extra q factor in there. The double dimer partition function is just a determinant of some weighted adjacency matrix. And what you find is that the 
well, I could have sort of called that as E of Q, each loop uh, surrounding the star, instead of, oops, instead of contributing a factor of two, it contributes a factor of Q plus one over Q. So if you expand the, the partition function here as, as a power series in Q plus one over Q, you can extract the coefficient CK, which counts configurations which have K loops surrounding the star. And of course, all the other loops get, uh, get a factor of two. Which, which allows you in principle to extract the number of loops surrounding a point. But, you know, this is a uh, one small sort of calcul calculation you can do to get some information about the number of loops in this uh, double dimer uh, loop soup. Uh, more generally, um, suppose I puncture several faces in this graph like those three faces with the stars in them, then uh, of course I can, I can think about more interesting sort of topological configurations. Like what's the probability that I have a loop which surrounds two of the stars, but not the third star, for example, right? I can, what's the probability that I have a loop which, uh, which uh, has some interesting, uh, uh, you know, homotopy class in the complement of those, of those uh, faces. Right. I, I'm taking two uniformly random dimer covers and superimposing them. An isotopic class of loop uh, in, the, in that complement. What's the problem, right? I take two random dimer covers of this graph and I ask, what's the probability that there's some loop which, which has this isotopic class? Yeah. Some loop, right? Right. Of course, for any particular loop, I can, in principle, compute the probability because of some using some determinants. But I want to sum over all possible all possible loops which have this particular isotopy class, homotopy class. Yeah, typically is more than one. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, what I'm interested in is the sort of scaling limit of this thing when the mesh, when my when my when n gets large and my if I think about this as a uh, finite, uh, if I take a finite region in the plane and then I take a very fine uh, square grid with mesh epsilon and let epsilon go to zero, but I fix those three points and I can ask about this probability, this probability will converge as epsilon goes to zero. What is the limit probability? For any particular loop at zero, but for the whole isotopy class of loops of that type, it's non-zero, and it depends on the location of those three points in an interesting non-trivial way. Right, that's the, in, the interesting thing about this model is that it's not true that all the loops uh, get smaller and smaller. There are loops of all possible sizes. Uh, uh, you know, no matter what epsilon is, there, there are loops that the probability of this event does not go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. And in fact, it, it turns into some, conjecturally it turns into some conformally invariant, well, I mean, not just conjecturally, it's a theorem here. For a long time, it was a conjecture, but then the recently, you know, these probabilities of any given isotopy class of loops uh, have a 10 to non-zero quantities in the limit, epsilon goes to zero, and they actually are conformally invariant in the sense that if I have some other domain, instead of taking a square, if I take some other domain, and I have a, uh, the, the Riemann map from this domain to that domain, which sends each point to the, some corresponding point here, over here. And I ask the same question over here, again, with, this, with a fine grid epsilon prime. As epsilon prime goes to zero, these probabilities are equal. So they only depend on the conformal type of the domain, of the puncture domain. Same, same. If I fix any uh, lamination, like, like if I want to have, you know, well, peripheral loops are a little bit uh, tricky to deal with, but I can, I can like double this loop like that and ask, what if I have, what's the probability of having 13 loops of that type? These will also be tend to some non-trivial interesting quantities in the limit. Also conformally invariant, yes. How do I answer these questions? Well, that's, here's where 
I, it's, it's useful to uh, change my line bundle to a rank two bundle, an SL2 bundle. So I'm gonna take an SL2 local system on the graph, which means, you know, at each vertex, I've got a two dimensional vector space. And along each edge, I've got a two by two matrix of determinant one, right? Uh, and now for any loop gamma in the, right, we've been talking about these loops. Uh, when, I have a, when I have a rank two bundle, I can, I can compute the monodromy, the, the composition of the parallel transports around that loop. And I get a, an element of SL2. Uh, that's called the monodromy of the connection around the loop. And this monodromy, of course, depends on where you start uh, but, uh, and it also depends on the, on, on the isotopy class, but the, if the, if, if I have a flat SL2 connection, that is the monodromy around every, every face is trivial, except for the punctured faces, then the monodromy will, the trace of the monodromy will be independent of the, of the isotopy class or, and the place I start. It only depends on the, oh, sorry, what did I say? <laughs> the trace will only depend on the isotopy class. Uh, not on the place where I start, that I start the loop. Uh, right, that's, that's what I just said here. Uh, for example, right, in, in, if this is my surface, I've just got two punctured faces, I can put a little uh, uh, zipper coming from this space out to the boundary, and I put the, the matrices A on those edges going from left to right, and likewise here, I put B on those edges going from left to right. This, this defines a flat connection. All the, other, all the other edges have identity on them. So then any loop uh, which, which doesn't surround any uh, puncture will have trivial monodromy, identity monodromy. But if I surround the first puncture, I'll get an A. If I surround the second puncture, I'll get a B or B inverse, depending on the orientation. And if I, if I have this blue loop here, which surrounds both then the monodromy going around the loop is A times B. So the, the trace of the monodromy for this blue loop is the trace of A, B. A and B are just matrices in SL2, arbitrary matrices in SL2. Okay, now if I've got a bunch of loops, uh, I can, if, if my double dimer configuration contains a bunch of loops, I can just take the product over all the loops of the traces of the, of the monodromies around those loops. And uh, the, the nice thing about SL2 as opposed to SL3 is that the trace does not depend on the orientation. Uh, if I, whether I go clockwise or counterclockwise, the trace of it, if I go, you know, I'll get the, if I go one way, I'll get the trace of a matrix. If I go the other way, I get the trace of the inverse matrix. But for SL2, the trace of the matrix and the trace of the inverse matrix are the same. So it doesn't really matter which way I go around. And the, the magic uh, uh, result, essentially due to Falk and Goncharov, is that the trace can be used, the trace of an SL2 connection can be used to detect the homotopy type of the loops. Uh, and so I have to explain what, what I mean by that. Um, maybe I go to the next slide. Uh, and I'll come back to that previous slide. So their theorem is that if I have a collection of loops, disjoint, simple loops on my surface, then the traces of the, of the product of the traces around the loop, they actually form a linear basis for the space of regular functions, for the regular functions on the character variety of SL2 connections. So uh, in principle, uh, right, th those traces, if, if you know the trace of the loop, you can, you can detect, you can reconstruct what the loop was as a function on, if you know the trace as a function on the character variety, the product of the traces, then you can reconstruct the lamination. Why is this helpful for us? Well, uh, we can take, uh, we can count, uh, we can compute a partition function for the trace, the traces of loops using the cast, standard cast lane theory for dimers. No, this is for arbitrary number of stars.
Yeah, there's all, yes, there is, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so uh, let, let me finish the statement and then we can discuss. Uh, so, and uh, just for, by, for illustration, I, I just illustrated in this, for this two by three graph, uh, but works for arbitrary graphs. I take my graph on my multi, multiply punctured disc. Um, and now I've got an SL2 connection. So on every edge, I don't, I don't have a, an edge weight. I've got a two by two matrix, an SL2 matrix along that edge. And uh, uh, well, kind of like in the, in the previous example here, right? I, I put the identity matrix on all the edges except for these two zippers. And then I can make a matrix, a, a, a castling type matrix. It's an adjacency matrix for the resulting graph, except that each entry now is going to be a two by two matrix itself. So here I get the matrix. Well, in, in this case, there's three white vertices and three black vertices. So I'm gonna make a three by three matrix, the matrix from whites to blacks. It's, a, it's an a weighted adjacency matrix where if the vertices are not adjacent, I put zero. If they are adjacent, I put, uh, I put the corresponding parallel transport, which is an element of SL2 in there. So this is your kind of matrix here. And there's some signs. The, the signs you throw in are the standard Castellane signs. Uh, from Castellane matrix theory, which is used to count dimer covers. So that's a, a matrix of matrices, um, but, uh, and I wanna compute its determinant. So what I'm gonna do is to just do the sort of the freshman thing, which is replace each two by two matrix with a, just a two by two array of numbers. So then I, it becomes, a, in this case, a six by six matrix in general, a two N by two N matrices, where N is the number of white vertices and black vertices. I take the determinant, uh, and then the magic thing is that that determinant counts double dimer covers where each configuration is, has, it contributes with the product of the traces of the loops that it forms, right? So uh, in my, in, right, it, when I take a, 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 a random double dimer configuration, I get a bunch of loops and each loop will have a monodromy and if it's a trivial loop, it doesn't surround any punctures, it'll contribute to the trace of the identity matrix. But if it goes around some punctures, it'll contribute the, the trace of its monodromy. And if it's got multiple loops, it's the product of the traces of the monodromies around those loops. In particular, as a special case, if my connection was the identity, uh, then the uh, every loop counts a factor of two, and I just reconstruct the the theorem from before. All right. Well, here I'm coming to the next open problem. So here, here I'm just repeating the statement. The determinant of this nice Castellane matrix counts the double dimer configurations with the product of the traces. But I want to, I can regroup this sum rather than having a sum over all configurations, I can just make the sum over all isotopy classes. If I, if I don't care about the end of exact loops, but I just care about uh, it, you know, what their homotopy classes are, also known as isotopy classes, uh, <clears throat> I can regroup the, all configurations according to their isotopy classes. And then I get, because the trace of a configuration only depends on the isotopy class, then I get some coefficient which is the sum of all configurations which, which lie in that particular isotopy class. And using this theorem of Fock and Goncharov, which says that these traces are independent functions, I can in principle extract the coefficients and those coefficients will give me the probability that that loop that of whatever configuration I want. So the corollary of this Fock and Goncharov theorem is that the, the, the uh, one can, in principle, compute the probability, in this case, the probability that your configuration contains this particular isotopic class or whatever isotopic class you want of loop. Uh, uh, but the, the catch here is that uh, while in principle this is possible because these are linearly independent, we don't know any good way to extract the coefficient from this expression. So this is a, uh, and it's a problem that the, uh, this, is sort of, this is sort of a kind of a representation theory. It's very similar to what, 
well, in, in any case, <laughs> uh, we have a particular basis, this sort of canonical basis for the regular functions on the character variety. And we have an, a particular element of that, uh, a particular regular function here. And I want to know the coefficient. How do I extract that from this? Uh, how, do I, how do I figure out, is there some sort of dual basis, which I could just hit it with this, to, to, with this dual basis to extract this coefficient? Um, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit theoretical, but you know, in the examples that we can actually say something concrete, and if our surface is, well, here, there's the only place in the talk where I really have a non-planar graph. But if I take a nice torus graph, like an n by n grid, where I glue the opposite sides together to make an n by n grid on a torus, I take a random double dimer cover, I can ask what's the probability of having a non-trivial loop uh, in that uh, of a particular homology class. For example, what's the probability that I have uh, two loops with homology class one one, like, like is illustrated here. And uh, that, that's actually something you can compute. This is a sort of a nice situation where you can use a Fourier basis to explicitly diagonalize things and everything is abelian. So the computation is not very hard. And the probability that your double dimer configuration, if in the limit as n epsilon goes to zero, the probability that it has, you know, K parallel curves of homology class IJ is, is has a kind of a pretty answer, a very beautiful answer. In fact, it's just proportional to e to the minus some quadratic form, which is related to the sum theta function uh, of the of the you know the conformal torus, the underlying conformal Riemann surface. So the in, in the cases that we can do actually do the computation, which almost no cases which we can do it, the answer is a very pretty, uh, in fact, a number theoretic uh, function. And so uh, it would be nice to, you know, uh, see if there's some sort of number theoretic content to the more general setting. All right. Um, <clears throat> let, okay, so now let me uh, go further and superimpose n dimer covers, not just two. Right, so what I did in this picture is I took three different dimer covers, a red, a green, and a blue, and just drew them on top of each other. And uh, uh, what you see is, of course, a collection of, well, what do we see? We've got tr some tripled edges. There are some tripled edges. There are some cycles, which are alternately uh, one followed by two, followed by one, followed by two, and so on. They're alternately one and two. And then there's some more complicated subgraphs. Uh, but, uh, and every, of course, every vertex has three colored edges coming out of it. So it's a degree, it's a sort of a degree three subgraph of the grid, but uh, with multiplicities. <clears throat> so we're going to call that a, I mean, a general three is, this is a three web. Uh, if I use, if I instead use n dimer covers, I'm going to get an n web or n multi web, multi web because I'm allowed to put uh, edges can have multiplicity higher than one. You can, if you want, you can call it an n-fold dimer cover. Uh, uh, I should say that, uh, you know, the, the n multi-web is what happens when you forget the colors. So, uh, uh, just like in the case of the double dimer cover, once you forget the colors, then there's some uh, fiber. Each multi-web comes from many possible sing, uh, the n-fold dimer covers. Uh, ordered n tuples of dimer covers. And the, the theorem, there's a theorem for counting these things as well. Uh, uh, this is a joint work with my, uh, with Dan Douglas, postdoc at Yale and my student, Howlin Shi. Um, if I have a planar graph G, then there is a version of the Castellane determinant, just like we did for the SL2 case. Uh, you put a SLN connection now on the graph. You look at the corresponding Castellane matrix. You take its determinant. It counts some sort of n-fold dimer covers with some with a trace, just like in the previous case. I mean, maybe I should go back and remind you that here's the previous theorem. Uh, it's exactly the same statement except for n uh, with two replaced by n. 
except that I have to tell you, you know, I didn't define what this trace of a of an n-fold dimer cover is, or an n-fold multi-width, n-fold multi-width. What is the trace? It's not just the trace of a matrix anymore, because a web is a more complicated graph, n, 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 n valent graph, with some with some parallel transports on the edges. So uh, I have to explain what the trace of a of a general web-like object is, and. <clears throat> Uh, this is not our definition. This is a definition which uh, people who do representation theory and, and scheme theory uh, uh, are familiar with. But let me, so let me just give you the trace of the web in the case n equals three, just for simplicity. It's just this slide. So what's a, what's a three web? It's a three valent graph. Uh, so each vertex has three neighbors and it's a bipartite graph. So the vertices are white and black. And at a, <clears throat> And remember that along each edge, I have this uh, three by three matrix in SL3. So what I'm gonna do is take my vector space, my three dimensional vector space, which was originally sitting over the vertices. I'm gonna put three copies of it uh, on each sort of half edge adjacent to that white vertex. So v, let me call them V1, V2, V3. And likewise at the black vertex, I'm gonna put a, uh, Another copy, I have also have a black uh, three-dimensional vector space. So I'm gonna put three copies there. V1, I'm gonna think of those as the dual vector spaces, V1 star, uh, well, anyway, three, three copies of the dual vector space at the black vertices. And now we're just gonna do sort of the, the, well, well, okay, now there's two steps. At each white vertex, I have a, I can take the tensor product of these three vector spaces and I have a particular element of that tensor product called the co-determinant. What's the co-determinant? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> here's the formula. And the, 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 it's a little complicated. The reason this is complicated is because the, there are three vector spaces and they each have dimension three. So it's confusing to get whether you're talking about the vector space or the index. So the superscript refers to the vector space which I should have called this V upper one, V upper two, V upper three. And the subscript is referring to the element of the basis of that vector space. So a vector space has a distinguished basis E1, E2, and E3. And uh, so then I take this, uh, this is a particular element of that uh, tensor product. That's called the co-determinant. There's a co-determinant at the black vertices too, which is, uh, which is kind of composed of the dual vectors. The reason, that, well, the one, one good fact about the co-determinant is that it's invariant under an SLN based, SL3 in this case, base change. Uh, and then the trace of the web is, well, you take the tensor product of all these co-determinants and then across each edge, you contract them using that uh, SL3 matrix along the edge or SLN matrix in general. Okay, that's what this notation means. Uh, it, it, it would require a, more time to really get you guys to understand what's going on here, but that's the formula. It's some na very natural tensor contraction, tensor contraction along the edges of these co-determinants. And well, here's an example. I suppose my web is, has this very simple graph, which is two vertices and three edges and three matrices, three parallel transports, A, B, and C, which are in SL3. So then the co-determinant at the white vertex has six terms, the co-determinant at the black vertex has six terms. And then, so I'm gonna, when I do the contraction, there's gonna be like 36 terms. Every term here is gonna contract with every term over here. And it'll give, give me some product of matrix entries. Like the first term, with the first term gives me ARR times BGG times CBB, where I started using R, G, and B for the, for the basis, because there were, otherwise there was too many ones, twos, and threes around. So the trace is this big sum of 36 different elements, sign sum with 36 things, which when you, you know, write it all out, you can write it in a much more compact form as the, tra as the actual trace of these matrices, AB inverse times the trace of CB inverse minus the trace of AB inverse CB inverse. So magically this, this, this 36 uh, quantities uh, turn into this quite simple compact form and if it, you can even write it even simpler as the determinant, as the X, Y, Z coefficient of the determinant of this polynomial X, A plus Y, B plus Z, C. Uh, but uh, 
more generally, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of out of time, but uh, more generally the trace can be, well, okay, this is, the, this is how you define it. Let me skip that part. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the theory for, unlike the SL2 case, the traces of webs don't form a linear basis for functions on the character variety because there's this gain relations which make everything slightly more annoying, uh, but the basic gain relation uh, allows you to rewrite a given web as a sum of simpler webs. What's a web is a tri trivalent graph. Uh, you, you can write it as a sum of sim simpler webs so that the trace of the original web becomes the sum of the traces of the simpler webs. And using those, that skein relation, you can take a, I'm just going very fast now because I'm out of time, I apologize. You could take a complicated web on the surface and on your surface and reduce it to a sum of much simpler webs, which are, and those simpler webs are called reduced webs. And the reduced, traces of reduced webs do form a, canonical basis for functions on the character variety. And the problem at the end of the day is the same. Uh, how do I extract from the determinant the coefficients uh, C lambda, which are uh, in front of the traces of where the, so I rewrite the sum of the, I rewrite this determinant as a sum over the reduced web, isotopy classes of reduced webs. And I wanna know how to extract the coefficients. Okay, I better stop here because I'm out of time. But there's a few more slides, but it's not so relevant. Thanks. Okay, so thanks very much, Rick. And now we'll take questions in the room and then switch to chat questions. Questions in the room. Yes. Can you speak up, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sure. Can, can we say something about this? This. Uh, can you repeat the question. Oh yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> Right, so the question is, uh, uh, dimers have the property that the degree one at each vertex is a, it's a one factor or a perfect matching of the graph. So the question is, what happens if we, for each vertex, we pick some you know, non-negative integer and we want a uh, set of edges or multi-edges which where the degree at each vertex is, is some prescribed integer. Uh, so the, 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 the polytope that I was talking about, the matching polytope has a natural generalization to that setting, uh, but uh, can we count its vertices or something like that? That's what I understand the question to be. Right. Uh, so the, the magic thing about dimers is that there's, for planar graphs is that there's a formula due to Castellane in the 60s that counts the number of dimer covers using the determinant of the some adjacency matrix, some signed adjacency matrix. And uh, I don't think there's any analog in a more general setting, uh, uh, certainly not in the most general setting. So that's, that's the sticking point. If, if we can't compute anything uh, using, there's no way to get started, get off the ground with computing probabilities. Yes, Jim. So, geometric, it doesn't seem like restricting But in a probabilistic setting, it seems like a very weird pull out of the numbers that you need. Uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know. Uh, there's no reason for us from a probabilistic point of view. So the question is, uh, is there any reason to consider negative edge weights or face weights? And there's, as far as I understand, there's no reason. I mean, I don't have any particular, <laughs> from a probabilistic point of view, there's no reason to, I mean, it doesn't make sense to have negative weights, uh, except that something magic happens and, and the, all the, even though the weights are negative, all the probabilities come out to be positive because everything's a rational function and it may be that magically all the probabilities come out to be positive. And, and in this problem that I was discussing, if you, if you look at that graph on the next slide, the lower one there, uh, if, if, I, if you choose a set of probabilities, positive probabilities, you know, actual probabilities, you'll find that there are two sets, there's two pre-images to that map. One of them is positive. The other one has some negative edge weights. So, but I don't know if there's any uh, use for those negative edge weights, except that they do happen to give the same probabilities. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. That's correct. Yeah, can you just repeat what Frank said? Oh yeah, so Frank said, uh, the fact that there's two pre-images means that there's some, it's a two to one map from uh, R. Well, there's an algebraic variety. There's an algebraic variety in the middle. Okay. Right, so, so, right, so the question is, uh, can we study sort of topologically what, the, what this uh, map is doing and is there some intermediate algebraic variety? That's what you're asking. There is one. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in SLN, uh, right, so the SLN case is that when I was talking about N webs, I give you examples of three webs, but uh, that works for SLN as well. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, if you ask me about GLN or something, I don't know that anything works or some other uh, league group. Yes, Alex. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's kind of a similar situation as I was doing here. I, I was uh, I was thinking of my surface as having some punctures on the faces, but you can also instead uh, remove a vertex and ask about the uh, how that how removing a vertex changes the probabilities. So if my underlying graph is a square grid and I remove a, a white vertex here and a black vertex here, how does that change the probabilities of events far away? This is the sort of electrostatic point of view, which uh, Mihai Chuku wrote many papers about that and uh, gave some very beautiful answers to those questions. But you can also ask some topological questions about double dimers in those settings. And those are actually tend to be much harder because there's uh, this extra uh, sort of electric field to take into, in, into consideration. Web. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, we don't know how to do it, but other cases where we know how to do it, like triple edge or something like that, um, particular coefficients, if we still can, or we can't compute any of those. We can't compute. Uh, 
unless the graph is simple, like a, for an annual. So the question is, are there special cases where we can compute some of these coefficients? And uh, the answer is only when the graph is quite simple, like an annulus or a torus and uh, two punctured disc, then we can compute the coefficients. But anything beyond that seems uh, sort of out of the range of the current technology because we have sort of, because if the fundamental group is commutative, then we can use uh, Fourier analysis uh, to invert the, co to, in to figure out the coefficients. For the torus, for the unpunctured torus, we can compute, yes. No, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't want to lie to you. So for SL2, we can do the torus. For SL3, in fact, there was even a slide at the end, which I didn't get to, but now I can. Uh, well, okay, that's, that's not the torus, but if you just have the, if your surface is a disc with two punctures, also known as a pair of pants, uh, you can have these reduced webs, which have quite complicated type, and we don't know how to compute their coefficients. So that's the sort of the simplest case where, where we don't really know what to do. It's a very simple surface, but it's got that graph there, the graph on the left, which you can sort of see illustrated on the right in a, in a nice uh, straightened out form, uh, ha has a particular coefficient and we don't know what to, uh, how, to, how to extract that from the Castellane determinant. Okay, uh, Lauren, sorry. Mark. This one yeah. or that one? Yes. Okay. That's right. That's what you see here, right? It's it. I okay. So. Right, so for those of you online, Lauren is trying to discuss the sort of moment polytope. I mean, this, this, this thing is a moment polytope of a particular toric variety. And uh, yes, there is a, because it's a polytope, there is some toric variety in the background. I'd be careful about generalizing this too much I mean, because this is a kind of a simple example, uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just... Yes. Yeah. 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 You're probably right. Now that I think about, okay. Okay. Let's talk about it afterwards. <laughs> Always happy to have my questions answered. <laughs> Are there some online questions? Yeah, we're there. We're done in the chat, right? Okay, then. Well, let's let's thank Rick one more time.